Um, biggest thing that we try to focus on is any service we provide, we always want to make sure that we have an in-house full-time strategist who is an expert in that subject matter, who will ultimately be building out and leading the process development for any changes to that service. Welcome back to the Outsourcing Scaling Show. My guest today is Pat Ahern. Pat, how are you doing? Things are good. Thanks for having me on board, Nathan. No, I'm excited to talk to you. I know a lot of people listening out there are trying to scale their agency. I know you've been able to do it at a high level using a lot of freelancers, a lot of virtual assistants. You're, you're a free up client. We we're just talking about the, the VA that you had with us. For those of you that don't know, Pat is a partner at Junto, the content marketing and web development agency that is powered by top vetted freelancers from all around the world. Outside of work, Pat loves rock climbing, traveling, and enjoying craft beers. I love all that except for rock climbing. I'm terrified of heights, fun fact. Um, but we're going to talk all about that. Before we do, let's take a gigantic step back. What were you like growing up as a kid? Were you a straight-A student? Were you a rebel? Did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Man, that's a great question. I feel like I have the worst answer out of any entrepreneur I've ever met because sadly, I was that straight-A like bookworm throughout pretty much all of high school. Um, but I think for me, I'm trying to think when it started, I think it was junior year of high school. I, uh, I was really fortunate. I got to go to a uh, private high school uh, named BC High. Um, and I noticed a lot of kids at the end of each semester when final exams were out would throw away their textbooks. And I being, you know, a broke college or broke high school student said, wow, I think I could make some money here. Started going dumpster diving for these books, selling them on Amazon. And that was kind of like the first mini business I started. Um, fell in love with it really early on throughout college. I was constantly trying and failing to start little businesses here and there. Um, I think by the time I got halfway through college, I said, okay, I, I think I know what I need to be focusing on. Grades kind of slipped from like the A's to more of the B's and it became like, okay, let's, let's focus entirely on the business sector now. Um, stumbled into the marketing realm. I guess it was probably my sophomore year of college, um, specifically working at an affiliate marketing company. And from there, it's just been entirely marketing centric, really focused on the SEO realm um, and almost entirely working in the agency space. So, so what, you worked for another agency or you started your own agency right off the bat? No, great question. So tried starting my own agency, um, learned a lot of great things from it. It, uh, it crashed and burned pretty badly. And fortunately, the business partners there were able to rise it back up from the ashes. Uh, from there, ended up moving to Colorado pretty soon afterwards, ended up joining another agency and worked as the head of SEO over there. Um, actually met my business partner there and the agency had been around for a long time, did a lot of things really well. Uh, but my business partner and I constantly found ourselves kind of just getting a lot of pushback on a lot of ideas we would bring forward. Right. Um, funny enough, the biggest thing was we're very firm believers in the freelance economy, which I'm sure you are as well. Right. Uh, but so long and short that we, we were really pushing to embrace the freelance economy, um, kind of looked at it from the perspective that agencies have a really hard time being profitable. And the more you can leverage, A, the best talent in the world as opposed to the best talent within, let's say, a 20-minute drive of your office. And B, the more you can leverage talent when you need it as opposed to having these full-time salaries that you are locked into for, you know, very minimum a couple of months, let's say, if it doesn't work out with someone. Um, so what we decided is after a lot of pushback, we said, hey, let's give this a try on our own. We started Junto in... I guess it was late 2016, uh, after probably about six months of moonlighting, jumped into it full time and have been doing it, uh, yeah, I guess it's since November 2016 at this point. I, I love it. So what's it like working with a business partner? Because I've heard so many agency owners that have struggled with that. I actually had a, a business partner, or I had an agency client who had a, a big fallout um, with one of his partners, what's that been like? And I kind of come from a place where my first hire ended up being my business partner. I got lucky right from the beginning. Um, and and I, I, I'm almost terrified to work with another partner because I, I've heard all these other horror stories. What's your experience been like? Man, that's a great question because going into it, I had heard so many horror stories as well. Um, one of my mentors, unfortunately, had a bad situation where things didn't work out with his first business partner. And uh, definitely created a big rift in the relationship. They were very close to each other before that. Um, in my case, working with David, it's, I mean, knock on wood, it's honestly, it couldn't have gone better to date. Um, he's just an all around really good dude. I think we complement each other very well. Um, he's definitely much more outspoken. I tend to be much more passive with things. Uh, but funny enough, when we come together, I think we do have, I would say just a very strong mutual respect, uh, respect for one another. 
And as a result, we're able to be very blunt with one another. We're able to say, hey, you know, you dropped the ball here. You know, what happened? And there's pretty minimal emotional rifts there. Um, I do think a lot of it started out, I give David full credit for this, uh, with probably the first quarterly retreat we had. Um, we had obviously been working together at a previous agency. That was for about a year. So we got to understand each other's working styles and learning styles pretty well there. Um, when we started doing Junto, though, we were basically working out of his, I guess, his home at the time, literally had probably 50 square feet between us and would rub up like elbows together at all times. Uh, but first quarterly retreat we had, we really just set the standard for, hey, this is our end goal for the business. This is what we value. Here's what I see as your flaws. Here's what I see as your strengths. Um, and it was a pretty emotional talk, but I think coming out of that, we had a really strong respect for one another, had a really strong understanding of a, who we were as people from another person's eyes, and B, got the sense that, hey, this other person has a very like profound understanding of who we are. Um, so I think a lot of it is really just communication, which I feel like is the vaguest answer I could possibly give here. Uh, but communication, respect, and then just willingness to really go above and beyond to help them out. And what does that look like on, on a week-to-week -week basis? Are you guys dividing up the tasks? Are you guys meeting every day? Is it, is it once a week, and then you go about it, and then you regroup? Well, what does that actually look like? Yeah, great question. So in my case, I'm lucky enough to have David and one of my other teammates actually working right next to me most days of the week. I say this as an exception because I'm currently the only one in the office as we can see right there. Um, we do remote days for everyone on the team, Tuesday, Thursday. I live five minutes from the office, so it's almost easier to come here. Uh, but David and I, for the most part, are working next to each other every day. Uh, what we've historically done is we've looked at really the different facets of the business and divided things up to some degree, I would say equally. David historically has taken on really all CEO, biz dev, and I would say like finance related responsibilities. My primary responsibilities have been overseeing all operations and overseeing all marketing. And certainly depending on bandwidth, you know, if he's really bogged down with client work, or I'm really bogged down with onboarding new teammates. Uh, we'll definitely take responsibilities from one another. Uh, but at the end of the day, we always say that each of us is in charge of one of those pillars of the business and has full authority to basically hand off responsibilities wherever they can. Um, it helps that both of us have a terrible work-life balance and are awful workaholics, but uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's been an awesome relationship so far though. So let's talk about freelancers. I think a lot of people think they can just start an agency and, and get the work and pass it off to someone and then hand it back to the client without being involved. And that's where they run into issues. Obviously having systems, having processes, having some level of quality insurance is important. How are you able to scale over time with these freelancers? What is your process? Man, that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna start out with the lawyer answer of it depends, but I promise I'll get better than that. Um, so for us, I would say, depending on what facet of the business we're looking at, the onboarding process will look a little bit different, but starting with overarching trends and habits that we have in terms of onboarding, um, I do think one of the big, uh, one of the big issues that we see in the general freelance world, let's say, and the thought perception that goes into the freelance economy is unfortunately, I think a lot of people live under the assumption that they can find this great freelancer who specializes in X or specializes in Y, can ultimately put them on a client project with minimal oversight, minimal processes, and no training, and just expect them to do the work and then be able to bill out you know, four, maybe six times that rate that the freelancer is charging them. We've decided since day one that any services we offer, we need to have very firm processes in place in order to actually roll out that service. So really the entire, I would say before you even get into hiring freelancers, the biggest thing to focus on is ensuring that there are concrete processes in place for everything that you're gonna ask that freelancer to do. Um, and I like to put this in the terms of, you know, make it so easy that someone who is like literally just getting out of school could look at this and say, okay, so this is how we do an SEO foundation at Junto or, okay, this is exactly how we do QA testing. And here's the document that we use to mark any sort of change requests that we need our lead developer to make here. Um, but once you get beyond those processes, which are, I guess I would say like step zero, um, biggest thing that I found is a, going through a testing project with all these different freelancers that you do find. So, you know, one of the things I love about free work, uh, free work, free up, <laughs> my apologies. Um, I was going to say one of the greatest things about it is the vetting process is obviously a lot easier than a lot of the other tools we've worked with. Um, we'll say there's a lot of other great platforms out there. Um, we've used Upwork quite a bit in the past and really only recently shifted over to free up. Um, but one of the nice things about free up is that 
I mean, obviously, I don't have to tell you this, Nathan, but uh, you guys do really just a kick-ass job of saying, hey, you know what, here's one freelancer, or maybe here's two or three freelancers that we would highly recommend. Why don't you try talking to them and see how things work out with them? But regardless of whether you use FreeUp and have one or two really high quality freelancers provided to you, if you use a tool like Fiverr, Upwork, and have to do just a lot more vetting yourself. Um, biggest thing we found is asking a couple of vetting questions that are gonna test out for hard and soft skills that are gonna be relevant for the freelancer. One of my all time favorite questions, really regardless of the role, is I'll ask a very vague question, something to the nature of, you know, my name is Pat Ahern, or my business partner's name is David. Uh, what's my email address or what's their email address? You know, the type of thing where if they take five seconds, they go on Google and they search for how to find someone's email address, they're gonna find hundreds of different articles telling them exactly how to do that. Um, but just little questions like that, that force them to think a little outside the box and force them to really show like, are they the type of person who's gonna go out and do their own outside research before reaching out with questions? Um, once we go through a couple of those hard and soft skill centric questions, we'll hop on a phone interview, just get a better sense for their experience and really just get a better sense for how do their answers that they're providing either on their resume, on the screener questions that we send them align with the actual phone interview. Um, and then some more technical questions that'll come into that. So if it's going to be SEO centric, content centric, I'll usually spearhead that conversation, ask them about uh, some just really jargony terms and see how they respond to it. Um, similarly, if it's web dev, my business partner, David, will tackle a lot of those questions with them. Uh, but once we find a few freelancers we're really excited about, what we'll do is we'll take them through the onboarding process that will start with putting them on a test project. Um, so we're very firm believers, and we've learned this the hard way, that uh, you ultimately shouldn't bring someone onto the team as a regular team member until you've proven their worth through a quality project that they've completed. Um, so if we're, let's say, bringing on a new web developer, what we'll do is we'll actually have them build out a single page uh, website and we've already created the design files. And throughout the process, we'll look at a, what is the quality of their code base? We'll have our lead developer actually uh, vet that, just see, you know, hey, are they incorporating inline CSS and JavaScript? Are they deferring JavaScript? Um, and a whole bunch of things along those lines. Are they using a repository like Git? Are they using, um, oh boy, Dylan would, uh, would be ready to strangle me with how poor this, uh, the web dev vetting stuff is. But uh, long and short of it, we'll look at just a lot of different elements in terms of trying to figure out what is their code base. Um, similarly with SEO, we might give them an SEO foundation and say, hey, here's a little bit of information about a sample client that we might be working with. Walk us through the process of how you'd build out an SEO foundation. And they're not going to be anywhere near perfect in most cases. Um, in some cases, we've been really lucky and they've been way better than us and we've been able to improve our process while bringing them on board right off the bat. Um, but the biggest thing we're looking for is A, how well do they communicate? B, do they ask really good questions? C, do they complete deliverables on time? And D, do they have a good overall knowledge about the subject matter? Um, once we've gone through that, then we'll start putting them on some easier client projects to a very small scale, make sure that they ramp up and that they're completing their work on time. And then ultimately we'll just scale it up from there. So are you hiring people that, that are, are highly skilled in bringing their own strategy or are you hiring more specialists and conforming them to your systems? Or are you hiring more, um, you mentioned like basic people, like just out of school that they, they, they may have a little bit of experience, but you want to get them to do it your way. It's a great question. So I would say a little mix of all three. Um, biggest thing that we try to focus on is any service we provide, we always want to make sure that we have an in-house full-time strategist who is an expert in that subject matter, who will ultimately be building out and leading the process development for any changes to that service. Um, that being said, we honestly have some really incredible people on the team who came on board and right off the bat or maybe six months in started asking really great, great questions saying, Hey, why are we doing this this way? Or have we thought about doing it that way? And when we get that feedback, you know, I would say within a month, we'll usually roll out the majority of that feedback to ultimately help to continue to improve our processes. Um, certainly we'll bring on some really highly skilled freelancers as well that might be coming in at a much higher hourly rate. 
Um, for us though, the biggest thing we found is if we can build out these well-informed processes based on the expertise of our in-house team, uh, and then can ultimately bring in freelancers that are very experienced, but may not be coming in at that hundred, hundred fifty dollar an hour range, then what we can do is keep costs much more reasonable for the end client, focus on delivering way better results for the budget they might have to work with any other agency in the country. Um, and ultimately just help them to grow much more effectively than we might see if we're working with just higher end freelancers. So short answer, definitely depends. We'll, uh, I would say the majority of our freelancers come in at the, you know, probably 20 to $50 an hour range, uh, really just depending on their expertise and how highly demand their expertise is. Uh, but I would probably say that's kind of the best overview I could give there. Well, let's talk about marketing. So what do you see working? We're, we're towards the end of 2019 when we're filming this, we're, we're talking this and beyond. Where, where do you think that the, the whole industry is going? Man, that's a great question. So I'm going to give a couple vague answers starting out and then I'll get a little bit more granular from there. Um, for us and for me as an individual, I would say I specialize in SEO and content marketing. Um, that's really, I would say one of the largest pillars of Junto's business is the content marketing slash SEO side of things. So my answers will, will probably be a little biased there. Uh, but as far as kind of the overarching content marketing and SEO trend goes, uh, the really vague answer I'll start out with that I think most SEOs would agree with um, is that long form content creation is really the way to continue to do content moving forward and probably will be for the very long term. Uh, Brian Dean had done a study back in, I think it was September 2016, uh, where he highlighted that the average first page result on Google is about 1900 words, give or take. Um, I'm sure that answer has probably varied a little bit just in the past, you know, two and a half, three years. Um, but, you know, this is compared to, let's say, a couple years ago when the average post was probably closer to 500, maybe 1,000 words that was ranking on Google. Um, so search engines are really starting to favor longer form content, obviously content that has a strong link profile behind it or domain. Um, but first pillar I'll start out with is that long form content creation is the content creation of the future. The second element, which is something we really started seeing around, I guess it would have been August 2018, is Google rolled out what they called their medic update. And long and short of it, Google started, basically we started seeing all this crazy fluctuation for health and fitness centric businesses. Um, you know, really just those that were offering any sort of medical advice with the term medical being used very, very vaguely. Um, a lot of these sites started getting slapped by Google, saw 50, 75% of their traffic disappear overnight. And the ultimate consensus that we came to is that this whole reason for this decline is that Google is starting to focus much more on how trustworthy are the authors of these articles that are coming out. Uh, it's basically outlined in their quality guidelines report that came out, which is called basically acronymed as EAT or expertise, authority, and trust. Um, so started out with that August, 2018, uh, back in June, I think it was June 3rd that this update started rolling out. Google rolled out a core update that we very firmly believe was based on a very similar feature, just rolled out for a much larger range of businesses. Uh, so our thought is focusing on building uh, what I would call like authorship, I guess it was back in, I think it was 2014 when Google, 2013, 2014, when Google first rolled that out, but focusing on building a name for yourself and your team members who are contributing content to the community. Um, ultimately getting these authors to have much more respect in the industry to be well-known names and ultimately just putting a face behind the content you are putting out is a huge trend that we're ultimately starting to roll out for all clients that we're working with and a really big trend I'd recommend other businesses working with. Um, we do very firmly believe that this whole eat element is going to really start to penalize sites that don't focus on it in the coming months, even more so than it has over the past, like let's say year. Um, other elements, you know, the really obvious one, I definitely still think that links matter to a massive degree. Um, another study, I think it may have actually been in that same Brian Dean article that came out 2016, showed that uh, the total number of domain backlinks pointing back to your article are, is the search factor that's most correlated with high rankings in search. Um, correlation definitely doesn't mean causation, but there's a really strong indicator that getting links 
ultimately is in line with you ranking at the top of Google for relevant queries. So the more you can focus on building relationships in your industry, um, or similarly doing outreach for articles that you are writing and trying to get a handful of links to them so that you can lock in that first, second, third position for your article uh, is ultimately gonna help you to see long-term success. Um, stepping back from, I would say content marketing though, or let's say like the blog side of content marketing, um, I'm actually gonna absolutely steal a quote from, ah, uh, oh, damn, I totally just blanked on his name. Um, Oh man, I just saw him talk a couple months ago, Bruce Clay. Sorry, if we can just wind that back for a second in the uh, the interview, I guess. But uh, so the other element that I'll incorporate in there, stepping away from like the blog centric side of let's say insights for where marketing is going, uh, stealing one tip from Bruce Clay. I uh, got to hear him speak a couple times over the past year, and he is a very very intelligent SEO. Um, he brought up a really great point that. Ultimately, Google owns YouTube. Google is starting to show more and more YouTube results in their search engine results pages. And he basically theorized that by, I think he said 2020, maybe 2025, that five out of 10 results for the average Google search query will be taken up by YouTube videos. Um, regardless of what the timeline is, I do think he's spot on with that general direction that YouTube is gonna start taking much more real estate in search results. Um, as a result, our team is in the really early stages of experimenting with video marketing for our own brand. Um, but businesses that aren't getting started with video creation, I would really highly recommend that. Um, one really simple thing you can do to start out, there's this great tool out there that we use in house for our processes and then also for YouTube video creation called Loom, uh, L-O-O-M. And basically allows you to create these short walkthrough videos. You can attach a screenshot of your face or actually have a live recording in the corner of your face. So what we'll do for processes, YouTube creation, uh, we'll ultimately create these short videos, upload them so that people on our team, so that our clients can actually view these and get these walkthrough videos of how to do things. Um, it could be a really great thing to incorporate in your content to keep people on the site to improve dwell time and ultimately improve search rankings. And over time, as YouTube hopefully takes up more real estate, it'll be a great way to even gain more search power. Um, other trends that we're seeing, I guess stepping back from the content side of things, we're definitely seeing that A, CPCs for Facebook ads are really starting to skyrocket. Um, Google AdWords has been doing that for a couple years and ultimately both of those platforms are giving advertisers a little bit less control as time goes on. Um, so it's definitely been very interesting to see what's happening there. Certainly wouldn't consider myself a PPC expert, so I don't want to get too granular in there. Uh, but I think more than anything, I'm just really curious to see, A, are any of these secondary advertising platforms going to really start to emerge, whether it's Bing ads, uh, Quora ads, Twitter ads, anything like that, as these platforms give less control to the advertiser and start charging more per click. Uh, but regardless, it'll be really interesting to see what does happen there. Awesome. Pat, this has been great. Where can people find out more about you and what are you most excited about for the rest of the year? Man, great question. So I would say finding me, Twitter is where I'm going to be the most active. Um, so if you want to do at Pat Ahern, P-A-T-A-H-E-R-N, followed by the number one. I uh, haven't been able to lock in my own name on Twitter, but maybe one of these days. Uh, but I'm pretty active on there. Otherwise, if you follow Junto underscore digital, um, we definitely tweet out a lot on there. Um, aside from that, things that I'm really excited about for the rest of the year, this is the, uh, the non-business answer, but Denver has been absolutely beautiful for the past month. Uh, it's been like, unfortunately, a little too warm for my liking recently, but just opens up the opportunity to do a lot of outdoor activities, uh, whether it's rock climbing, hiking, camping, uh, if I'm not in the office, I'm probably doing one of those things. So uh, just really excited for all that, I would say. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on and, and have a great rest of the day. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Did you enjoy this content? If so, click like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel so we can continue bringing you great content all about hiring.